Welcome to another episode of Culinary School Stories, the bi-weekly podcast that is dedicated to sharing the stories of people around the globe whose lives have been influenced, impacted, touched, and or enriched, for good or for bad, from their culinary school experience. Hi, my name is Colin Roach and I'm your host. Thanks for joining us today. You are an important part of this show where we ask the question, what's your culinary school story? So now, without any further delay, let's meet today's guest. I'm so excited to be here with you all today. My guest today has a great story. He entered the Army through the Army Reserve's Office of Training Corps program at Eastern Kentucky University, where he majored in criminal justice. He then went on to serve as an infantry platoon leader and pathfinder platoon leader in Germany before volunteering for special forces training, where in 1985 he earned his Green Beret. While in the Special Forces, he served in various positions for 16 years, including in Desert Storm, Desert Shield, Germany, Haiti, Central and South America, until his retirement in the 2000s as the Deputy Special Assistant for Public Affairs for the Office of the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the Pentagon. Upon retiring from the Army, he went on to attend the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center's Police Training Program and became an area commander for the Federal Protective Services in Miami, Florida. And as if that wasn't enough, in 2006, he decided to return to school where he earned a degree in culinary arts from Johnson & Wales University, graduating with honors and earned the Volrath Culinary Excellent Award. After a great culinary career, he now enjoys cooking as a private chef for his wife, two dogs, family members, and any hungry, wayward souls that happen in the southern Appalachian Mountains where he currently lives. Please welcome today's guest, retired Green Beret, Lieutenant Colonel, good cook, Mr. Douglas Wisniewski. Hey, Chef. How are you? Good to be with you. How are you? I'm great. I couldn't be better. Good to be with you. Um, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show today, and I want to start out by saying welcome and thank you for coming on the show. Well, it's it's certainly great to be here, and it, it's really an honor, and uh, I'm really excited about it. Awesome. Now, I'm going to start out with some easy questions for our listeners, for the audience that might you know may not know, so um, we'll kind of go there. You did go to Johnson & Wales University in North Miami, is that correct? That is correct, Chef. So as a non-traditional student, you already had quite a career and, you know, we're older than some of the typical students. I want you to give us your perspective on that first day in school. You know, what do you wish you had known before you started? What was it like going on to campus? Did you think you were going to fit in? I mean, tell us about some of your thoughts on that area. Sure. Well, I wasn't too worried about fitting in. Um, certainly, I had those kinds of challenges throughout my life. However, I will tell you, I went in and picked up my uniforms, my knife kit, my books, and uh, brought them all home, spent the night starching my chef coat, and my pants, and spit shining my shoes, and, and getting ready to make sure I was clean shaven, had a good haircut. And uh, of course, because of my military background, I showed up 15 minutes early, like you're supposed to. And I walked into the first class, which was Chef Hensley, uh, a giant of a guy, and, and an older guy, older than me. And as soon as I walked in, he just looked at me and he gave me a look from head to toe real slow. And then he looked back at me straight square in the eye and he said, what service? <laughs> I said, army chef. And he said, <laughs> he picked it right up. Oh, he did. He did. And, and we became very good friends over the two years that I was there. And he was a great mentor and, a, and a, just an incredible instructor. Awesome. So in, in addition to that, I, I think one of my other biggest challenges was the fact that I was almost 50 years old and I was going to school with 17 to 21 year olds. Now that in itself was a bit of a challenge, a complete generational gap for sure. But it, it all worked out. I think in the first couple of weeks of school, one of, the, uh, one of my fellow students yelled across the kitchen one day, hey, uh, he said, hey, Dougie Fresh. <laughs> and I said, Dougie Fresh? I said, no, 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 you call me Doug Nasty. <laughs> and that name stuck for the next two years. Great. Um, let's, before we jump on, go into culinary school and into the stories a little bit more, the culinary system, obviously, most people know, is you know, kind of structured after the brigade system, which is kind of like the military. So with your unique perspective of having that military background, do you see similarities between it? Was it similar? Was it no? It's not even close? No, it was absolutely uh, spot on. There's, there's definitely a chain of command. You know, from executive chef all the way through the uh, the sous chef and and all the way down to uh, 
the guard marge. I mean, um, everybody has their role to play as part of a team and uh, there's a mission to accomplish and there's certain ways to do things uh, and there's certain ways not to do things. And I think it's a very, just an awesome system. I fit right into it. I mean, that's what I've done for, you know, the majority of my life. So that was nothing new for me. I think it was pretty new for a lot of the younger students, though. They didn't quite sometimes understand uh, because, of course, you know that uh, while we were there in each culinary class, in each lab that we had, there was a chef of the day. And that chef of the day was expected to run the entire kitchen. So some of them learned some very hard lessons about how to become that, you know, that leader, that chef that's in charge of the entire kitchen. Yeah, good points. Uh, I've never been in the military myself, but I do know like we did lineups, you know, with the students to check uniforms to go through that. And, you know, and my impression is that's kind of the same way, at least boot camp, uh, I would guess. Is that true? Yep, it it certainly is. And then throughout your career in the military, for sure. I, I remember those lineups very well. And I remember there were times when students came in either unshaven or their shoes weren't shined and they were sent back to their dorm room to get things squared away before they were allowed to come back into the lab. In fact, in in, uh, in our dining room class with uh, Chef Marcella, I had to teach some of the students how to shine their shoes. They had no clue how to put kiwi on black leather and make it shine. So I had to do that. Yeah. The- Gave him a quick lesson in discipline and uh, professionalism and all the other things culinary schools, you know, try to reach out and, and touch and, and teach the student. Well, I, I think, Chef, you know, what's important is, is that if you're an executive chef, uh, you've spent a lot of time trying to figure out your menu exactly how you want it. And there has to be that, that discipline to execute your vision of what you want to put on a plate. And culinary school for sure teaches you you know, that that discipline, it, it absolutely has to be there. We, we can't have, you know, the, the lone wolf going off and, uh, you know, plating the way that they think it should be done. It's got to be done exactly the way the executive chef wants it. Great. You were uh, traveled all over the world. You're a desert storm, desert shield, um, a lot of places. Tell me about the food. Was the food good in the military? Where you traveled? Were you, you know, as officers get a different food? Uh, t- tell me about that. Was that part of your drive to go to culinary school? Well, uh, Army food uh, ranks probably down towards the bottom of the services. The Air Force certainly has the best, and I've eaten in some Air Force dining facilities that were just awesome. I did get to eat in the Admiral's Mess on the USS Mount Whitney while sailing to Haiti for Operation Uphold Democracy, and that food was incredible. As you know, the military chefs, you know, compete every year, and they just have some really talented folks that do that. It it really wasn't, uh, you know, I I love German food. I spent six years in Germany. English food, not so much. Uh, I spent a year there, but... The food, the food I really enjoyed was uh, in Central and South America. Just the flavors, the, the bold taste, the, just how it looks. It's bright. It's fresh. You know, that's really kind of the food that when I was in culinary school that I really wanted to come out the other end being able to do. I would tell you that it's not the reason that I wanted to go to culinary school. The actual reason that drove me to go to culinary school was as an officer in the military, you don't make anything. You don't do anything with your hands. You make lots of decisions. You plan, you advise, you assist, you train other people, but you don't produce anything. And I had that itch and I really needed to scratch it. And the best way for me to do that was to go to culinary school and learn the skills of what I needed to do to produce that plate of food. And to me, you can have all the medals in the world, but to me, being able to take a plate of food that you prepared yourself and place it in front of someone and see just the joy in their face when they taste your food, that, that's, that ranks right up there better than anything else. Yeah, I agree. What advice would you give to someone that wants to pursue a career, you know, similar to yours that may have been already had a career, they're on the second career and they want to go back to school, um, you know, they want to enter into the culinary world, into a kitchen. Any advice you would give to someone in that aspect? Um, For anybody who's been in the military that has that desire, and I've talked to a lot of military, former military folks who say, yeah, I'd love to go to culinary school. And I kind of smile and and look at them and go, okay, that's a good idea. Uh, And then they tell me they want to open a restaurant. And I say, well, maybe that's not such a good idea, but you need to think real hard about the first part before you go to the second part. And, And what I would tell them is absolutely go for it. It is that chain of command kind of environment they're used to. I think it's, it's worth exploring. But 
the biggest piece of advice I would say is to really research culinary schools that are out there. And of course, they've they boomed. I mean, they're everywhere now. Most community colleges have them. But you've got to be very, very careful in choosing a school that's going to provide you with a real education. And I'll give you by way of example, and I don't mean to disparage this school, so I won't use their name. However, prior to coming to Johnson & Wales, I visited another culinary school in the Miami area. And one of the things I noticed while I was there was that everything was done by demonstration. The chef instructor was at the front of the class. There were video monitors around the room. And the students were almost lectured to while that chef instructor demonstrated. There was very, very little hands-on. And in fact, the chef instructor or the, the director of culinary instruction or education at this school was a Johnson & Wales graduate. And I asked him, I said, so let me ask you a question, chef. Why should I go to your school as compared to Johnson & Wales? And he said, why are you? I'd go to Johnson & Wales. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the big difference was that Johnson & Wales is that you're hands-on every day. When you're doing your culinary labs, you know, you show up at, at for me, it was seven o'clock in the morning. I'd be there at 630. You do your lineup, you do your inspection, you're in the class for maybe an hour of lecture, but then it's hands-on. You know, you go and retrieve all the product from uh, bring into the into the kitchen. It goes in the walk in and you've got your assigned uh, recipes that you're going to cook for that day. And you're into it. I mean, there is no you know real lecture type kind of thing. It's it's all hands on. And the chefs are there. If, you know, they were incredible instructors and teachers. If you had any question uh, or even if you didn't have questions, sometimes I remember one day, Chef Vinegar, uh, I was making a bear blanc. And evidently, I didn't put enough butter in the pan because he came over and put a whole pound of butter in my pan <laughs> and said to me, this is the way it's supposed to be done. I said, thank you very much, Chef. Great. Uh, what is one thing you wish you had known when you began your career in culinary school before you graduated? Something when you went to the school, maybe a preconceived notion you had that was or was not true when you finally got there? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think. Let me try and say this in, in, a, in a tactful way. I didn't expect to come out the other end as the next Emerald Lagasse or Bobby Flay or, or anybody like that. I mean, I knew that there was going to be a, you know, a, a hill to climb to get to where I wanted to go. But to tell you the truth, I really wasn't even sure where I was going to end up and what I was going to do with it. So I, I think that was a bit of a challenge. I think sometimes some of my fellow students came in and they had that expectation that they were going to leave culinary school and step into an executive chef job. And we know that that's probably not going to happen. Fortunately for me, I did become an executive chef straight out of the gate. Now, while I was in school, certainly I worked in different catering companies. I worked in different restaurants around Miami. I cooked for a family in Coral Gables uh, as a private chef. So I did a number of things trying to figure out where I fit and, and where I should be going and how I should be doing things. The executive chef story is a different one. If you'd like to go into that, I can do it now or we can talk about it later. Yeah. Tell me what you did when you got out of culinary school. How did it work for you? Where did you start? You know, and then <laughs> how did you get to that executive chef position? Well, um, while I was in school at Johnson & Wales, for the most part, I lived on my 37-foot sailboat uh, in Key Biscayne or in, in right off of Biscayne Boulevard in a marina. And so it was almost time to do my internship, which I did a lot of research on and ended up going to... Little Palm Island down in the Keys, which at the time was a very, very highly rated resort and restaurant by Condé Nast Traveler. Did you pick that place not because it was, you know, four star, five star perfect, but because you could bring your boat? Well, it was that was a dual uh, reason. But the real reason I wanted to go was that the executive chef was was he was Peruvian and his style of cuisine was modern tropical. And that's really what I wanted to get into. However, uh, at Little Palm Island, to get to work, you have to ride a uh, 1950s wooden ferry boat out to Little Palm Island to go to work. So the first day, I was waiting there for the boat, and uh, the executive chef walked up, and we're riding on the boat, and he said, uh, so, how good are you with breakfast? And I said, breakfast? He said, yeah. And in my mind, I was thinking, hold on. I'm coming here because I want to learn your style of cook. I, I, I can cook breakfast for sure. <laughs> wow. I, I'm coming here because I want to be, I want to learn your style of cooking. I want to be cooking entrees or at least watching people cooking entrees. 
breakfast? Yeah, okay, but I'd like to slide over and do this other stuff. Well, long story short, he paired me up with his breakfast chef, uh, who was a great Cuban line cook who didn't speak any English. And after the third day of being there, uh, he quit, which left me as an intern to be the breakfast chef for Little Palm Island. I can tell you that that was a serious hill to climb. It really was. Not only did I do breakfast, but then I had to do the family meal for the entire, all the employees that worked on the island. In addition to that, I had to prep everything for lunch and do lunch. So I was breakfast and lunch guy and my hair was on fire. I soon learned out, learned the term uh, in the weeds, and I used to have nightmares of the ticket machine. Yeah, you hope it runs out of paper at some point. <laughs> oh my God. Well, I have to tell you, uh, we ran into a little difficulty, a difference of opinion between the sous chef and myself. This Peruvian lady was the, the sous chef. The executive sous chef was her boyfriend, and she and I did not get along, and it, it got ugly. She started questioning... Uh, a lot of things about me, including my ability to speak English, because she had given me an order. I didn't understand the order that she wanted. We were making a churrasco steak, which was marinated, blank steak, and uh, or skirt steak. And when she said to me, uh, I need a churrasco steak with garlic and oil, I said, well, chef, would you like this with the churrasco marinade, or do you want me to get a separate piece of skirt steak and use garlic and oil to cook it? And she said to me, what's the matter? Don't you speak English? in a very thick Peruvian accent. It didn't go well from there. I went into the walk-in, I grabbed a 40 pound pack of skirt steak. I came out and slammed it on my table, which hit a spoon, which happened to be on my station, which I did not know was there, which flew across the room and stuck into the wall. Wow. So at that, at that point, um, I just packed up my knife kit and headed to the ferry and got back there and called Johnson & Wales, called Melanie down there in the, uh, in the student office uh, handling internships and said, you need to find me a new one. And thank God she did. And I ended up at uh, Tallulah, a restaurant in Miami Beach, uh, owned and operated by Chef Andrea Curto Rondazzo, uh, who was also a top chef candidate on the TV show. Fantastic, great teacher, uh, incredible chef. And I had the time of my life. Spent a month there and then, uh, and then it was towards graduation. Cool. So after graduation, I just, I just like to back up. So, so while I was at Little Palm Island, uh, I received an offer for a job from Aramark to be the executive chef, Florida International University, FIU, to be their executive chef. And so they sent me an email and said, hey, we'd like you to come. Here's a list of things that uh, we want you to cook. We want you to cook a, an appetizer, a soup, an entree, and a dessert. And you can use anything in the walk-in. I said, great. So I'll be there. So I took a few days off from my internship at Little Palm Island. I went there and uh, I decided to make a, uh, a tostone with a black bean, black bean and chorizo uh, salsa with a little cilantro sour cream on top. Served that on banana leaves. For the main course, the entree, I did sea bass with asparagus risotto and... Uh, some honey and lime marinated ginger carrots, I think is what I did. And for dessert, I did a key lime pie. Classic. Great. So it was time to serve. So uh, I would bring in each course and explain what I had prepared for them. And I would stand back and watch them. And, and chef, I have to tell you, this was probably the best culinary experience I ever had. I was watching them and they were talking amongst themselves, smiling and eating the food and just devouring it. And I thought, hmm, okay. So I get about halfway through and I'm delivering the entree and the hiring manager who was there said to me, uh, Doug, I have to ask you a question. He said, listen, he said, uh, we know your military background and all that other kind of stuff, but where did you learn to cook like this? Did, did you learn this on your own or did you learn this at culinary school? I said, well, chef, here's the way it works. Uh, back in my military days in special forces, when we would go to a foreign country, we would do a, a basically an immersion program in that country. We would learn the language, cultures, the food, the, everything about that country. And basically, for the past two years, I had done a culinary immersion because all I did was eat, sleep, drink, do everything food, which is, I think, really what's required. If you ever want to be a success coming into culinary school and coming out of culinary school, you have to totally immerse yourself into it. You can't be focused on anything else from the time you get up in the morning until you go to bed. Uh, everything should be totally dedicated to the focus on food. So I thought, great, looks like I'm going to get this job. Well, guess what? The next day, the hiring manager quit. 
And Aramark didn't know what to do. So they called me up and said, Doug, we've got another position for you. I said, great. Well, it was to be the executive chef at uh, St. Thomas University. So I went there. I met the, uh, the manager from Aramark. And she said, okay, here's the salary. And uh, come on in tomorrow morning. You'll be good to go. Well, chef, I got to tell you, I've had a lot of challenges in my life. But this one, this one is right up there at the top. The, uh, the kitchen hadn't been cleaned, I'm going to say, in several years. <laughs> the grease traps were overflowing. The dishwasher didn't work. And the dishwasher didn't work because they had a Haitian dishwasher, old fella, and they had three women that worked there. And they would get on his case about cleaning the dishes. So he'd say, ah, hell with you guys. He'd throw forks and knives and spoons down the disposal and jam it all up. That's why it didn't work. <laughs> so there was not one fresh vegetable in this kitchen. Uh, everything was canned. The hiring manager or the, uh, the, the culinary manager at the school uh, said to me one day, Hey, listen, did you, did you see the, uh, the bulletin board? I said, yes, ma'am, I did. I, I see we have lunch for 200 tomorrow. She said, yep, yep, yep. I said, well, ma'am, hold, hold on a second. I said, um, it says we're making chicken marsala. I said, ma'am, we don't have any marsala wine. She said, oh, I know. She said, we have some cooking wine. <laughs> I thought, great. Okay. She said, she said to me, uh, yeah, and, and there's brown rice. I said, well, ma'am, we, we don't have any brown rice either. And she said, no, just put some, some beef base in it. It'll be fine. It'll, it'll be brown. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my God. Okay, this is for 200 people, which happened to be a, a luncheon for the, uh, the Archdiocese of Miami, where the bishop was going to be there. And Now you know why the guy quit. I do. And actually, I should have known right from the beginning because he was a little skinny guy. And uh, he told me that he weighed 350 pounds when he started the job. <laughs> so how did you pull it off? Well... I had these three ladies that could work four hours a day for me. I said, I lined them up and I said, ladies, does anybody here know the three-step breading process? And they just looked at me like I had a horn coming out of my head. And I said, okay, so we're going to learn that today. So sure enough, we get started. And no sooner do I get started breading chicken, one of the ladies grabs a tray, a sheet tray off of the rack and sprays chicken juice all over the counters. So we had to have a little break, clean that up. And then we got started back again. So we had to take everything, put it in hot boxes, of course, and get it to the dining room, which was about mm, probably a quarter mile away. So uh, I said to the ladies, okay, uh, how, are we, how are we getting the food there? And they said, well, Johnny's going to take it. And I thought, okay, I don't know who Johnny is, but if that's what you guys have done in the past, great. So I go to the dining room and there, people are coming in and they're, they're sitting down. One lady comes up to me and she says, excuse me, chef. I said, yes, ma'am. How can I help you? She said, well, the water tastes like coffee. I thought, huh, well, look you there. Somebody used the wrong coolers to put water and coffee in. That's all right. Okay, we'll fix that. Easy day. But now there's no food, chef. There's nothing showing up. So I asked one of the ladies, I said, where's Johnny? They said, we don't know. I said, okay, I'll be right back. So I went on my search for Johnny. Johnny was a special needs student, and I had never met him before. And Johnny was in charge of bringing my food to this lunch. <laughs> About a half a mile away, walking down a sidewalk with a huge kitchen rack is Johnny just walking down the sidewalk. So I caught up to Johnny. I got him. I said, come on, Johnny, let's go. We got to get the food back to the dining room. So we did. And we started finally serving the food. And um, at one point, a gentleman came up to me in a three-piece suit, uh, black gentleman. And he said to me, chef, can I talk to you for a second? And I thought, oh boy, here we go. This is going to be the end of it. So he took me aside. He said, Chef, can I, can I talk to you? I said, yes, sir. What can I do for you? What's, what's the problem? He said, oh, there's no problem. Now, mind you, this is, this is for the Archdiocese, the Catholic Church uh, at, at St. Thomas University. And he looks at me and he says, this is the best goddamn chicken we've had in two years. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't even marsala with brown rice. No, no, no. It was whatever. Yeah. So that was, my, uh, that was my introduction. I stayed there at St. Thomas for about three weeks and nothing was getting better. Um, I was basically a one-man show. I had a uh, female chef that would come in in the afternoon to do the dinner meal, but that was about it. And uh, at that point, I said, well, you know, this isn't working out so good. And luckily, by the grace of God, Johnson & Wales had a position that was open. Uh, in the career counseling office. And so I ended up going back to Johnson & Wales and, uh, and went to work there for 
I guess about 18 months. I got to be an adjunct professor teaching career skills, uh, interviewing techniques, all that kind of stuff. So that was very, very enjoyable. Plus, I was still connected to the school. Uh, there were opportunities to engage in the dinners that would, would go on and I could go in the kitchen and cook and, and do that kind of stuff. And that all went really well until my former sergeant major from the 3rd Special Forces Group and my best friend called me up one day and made me an offer I couldn't refuse. He said, I have a, a position for you up here at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina to teach the Coast Guard counterterrorism techniques advanced marksmanship, close quarter battle. And yeah, he made me an offer I couldn't refuse. So I went home and talked to my wife and said, we're going to move to uh, North Carolina. So it was, uh, it was kind of bittersweet. I still certainly enjoy cooking all the time. I love it. I still read about it. I still spend the majority of my time researching food and recipes and, and new techniques and, and try and stay in the game. Are you sure. not in uh, North Carolina now though? living? No, no. We're in the the mountains of uh, Northeast Tennessee in the Appalachians. We're at 3,500 feet in a log cabin on 24 acres of land. What brought you there? Not a job, not the sailboat. (laughs) No, I I worked, no, I worked for the Coast Guard uh, on a contract with them for eight and a half years. And the contract was changing over. Uh, I had done, spent my time there. I'd done everything I could do. Um, So I pretty much decided to uh, take a break for a while. And uh, we had been looking at properties out here for a few years, and we stumbled on this place. Uh, again, a deal we couldn't refuse. <laughs> <laughs> so as a non-traditional student, did you find the chef instructors that you had, were they, were they tough? Were they difficult? Were they? Tell me a little bit about your impression of the different chefs that you had. Sure. I think every one of them that I had as an instructor was totally dedicated to making sure that I succeeded. They were tough. but they're in a tough business. And all of the instructors that we had at Johnson and Wales, uh, I mean, their resumes were incredible. Chef Benninger had been a a chef in Miami at one of the largest, most well-known hotels on Miami Beach for 20, 25 years. I mean, that's the level of experience you had that were providing you with their knowledge. They were incredible. They were absolutely professional to a fault. And uh, they, they made sure that they challenged you and, uh, you know, my, I think I wrote down there somewhere about uh, my first grated plate, which uh, was with... Yeah, tell us about yeah, that. Which was with uh, Chef Brian, uh, God rest his soul. The meal that I had to prepare, I think, was a, uh, it was a breaded flounder. Um, I had some sort of sauce, you know, a vegetable and, and a starch. I can't remember. I think it was some rice. And this was my first plate. So I thought, boy, I'm really going to do good at this. Well... I brought it out there and I set it in front of him and he just looked at me. He didn't taste it. He just stared at me. And then, pardon my French, but he said, what the fuck is this? I was devastated. I mean, I I didn't know what to do. I thought, oh my God. So I just, you know, and you had a a primary test and then you had a retest the next day. So I went home that night and I mean, I beat myself up. I mean, I sat down and I, I went over the timing for the dish. I went over different plates and drew them all out. And I mean, I went all night long and came back the next day and I put the second plate in front of him and he looked at it, tasted it while he's looking at me. He said, Doug, if you continue to cook like this, you're going to make a lot of people very happy. Wow. Well, at that moment, that was all the validation I needed. I mean, I was, I was, I was on my way. And then he looked at me and he said, but you know, I really am disappointed in you. I said, what now, chef? He said, you only got a 98 on your written exam. <laughs> <laughs> what was your best class? What was your worst class? I think storeroom was my worst class. And it probably should have been one of my best, but it was my first class. It certainly wasn't Chef Hensley's fault. Um, it was all me because I was trying to navigate my way through the first days of culinary school. It was incredibly detail-oriented. There were a lot of things coming at you because it was techniques, it was learning about storage of food, how to take care of food. And the written exam was, we had to name on a piece of paper, I think 200 food items. I mean, I'm talking adzuki beans. I had no idea what an adzuki bean was, okay? And you know, they're, they're laid out on tables. Um, and you have to walk around with your piece of paper to try and figure out what all, it, luckily because I was old as I was and because I traveled around a lot, you know, I did pretty well in the test, but Boy, that was a challenge for sure. I think probably my best class that I enjoyed. Now, you'll get mad if I say it wasn't you. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I think my best was uh, was French cuisine. 
Uh, I really enjoyed that. That was uh, because in essence, that is where it all comes from. You know, that's where all of the classic techniques come from. And uh, I, I wish I could have had another two weeks or a month, you know, in that, in that lab. It was terrific. So would you do it all again? Was it worth it? Was culinary school, like some people say, now go learn on your own? Or was it needed? Was it, tell me, tell me your thoughts. And now looking back with perspective and reflection, tell me about it. I, w- I would absolutely do it again. It was, it was a lot of hard work, but I think that the joy, again, like I told you earlier, my ability to put a plate of food together and place it in front of someone just and, and watch their enjoyment, their, their excitement about it, um, just fills a spot in me that, that I don't know, very little else does. Um, an incredible experience. Yeah, it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a lot of work. But I think the real thing, you know, as you said, well, should I go to school or should I learn it on my own? I think the real difference is, is that in culinary school, you are going to learn the classic techniques exactly how to do them. And you're going to do them over and over and over and over again until you get it right. And it allows you the opportunity to make the mistakes, but it also at the same time allows you that time to learn and to be able to really, you know, put your stamp on it. You get exposed to so many different chefs and perspectives as well, I think, which you do. You know, oftentimes when you're just going through the industry, you get one or two chefs. Yeah. And I mean, depending on their level of, of experience and, and their education, you know, you're going to get what you get. Well, great. Well, this has been awesome. You know, this is really good. And I want to thank you for being on the show and, and sharing your knowledge with the listeners out there and, and, and giving them a little taste of, you know, your perspective of what culinary school is and, and telling us, you know, what, what your thoughts are on it. Well, Chef, I really appreciate the opportunity. It's been great to see you again. Hopefully it's not another 12 years before we get together, but uh, great, great to see you. And, and thanks for the opportunity. Well, thank you. And a big thanks and appreciation also goes out to all of you, the listeners. We hope you enjoy the show and this episode. You all are a big part of this show, so please let us know what you think. Your comments are always welcome, and they help us in making the best show possible. You can email them to culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. That's culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. Or even leave us a voicemail at area code 207-835-1275. That's area code 207-835-1275. And if you like the show, we have a big ask of all of you. And that is to share the podcast with everyone you know. And to give us a positive rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Okay, until our next culinary school story, take care and be well. Bye-bye.